In a 1957 New Jersey movie theater, a study was carried out by James Vickery on the effects of subliminal messaging. The words, eat popcorn and drink coke, were repeatedly flashed onto the movie screen for a third of a second, with thousands of moviegoers being exposed to the secret messages over a six-week period. According to Vickery, this led to an 18% increase in coke sales and a rise in popcorn sales of almost 58%. This led the FCC to rule that the use of subliminal messages could result in the loss of a broadcast license, and subliminal advertising was banned in the UK and Australia. However, there was a fair bit of scepticism around Vickery's claims, and others were unable to replicate his results. In one study, the Canadian Broadcast Corporation subliminally flashed Phone Now 352 times during the television show Close Up. The viewers were asked to guess the message, and hundreds of letters were sent to the station, with about half of these claiming to be hungry or thirsty, obviously aware of Vickery's study. However, no one had called the station or even guessed correctly. It wasn't until 1962 that Vickery admitted his study was a hoax, an attempt to increase customers for his failing marketing business. However, this confession from Vickery did little to change the opinion of the general public about the effects of subliminal messages and some more recent studies have shown certain types of subliminal messages can have an effect. So, should we be worried? Let's find out. It's been estimated that across all media, each day we are exposed to over 360 adverts. And with the average American watching four and a half hours of television a day, the potential impact of subliminal messaging is huge. But what exactly counts as subliminal? A common definition states that a stimulus is subliminal when it is below the threshold of conscious awareness and cannot be subjectively identified or discriminated from an alternative stimulus. For example, in one study, participants were shown pictures of irregular polygons for one millisecond way too quick to be consciously aware of it. Afterwards, the participants were presented with pairs of figures, one which they had been exposed to previously, and one which was new. They were asked to say which shape they had seen before, and which shape they preferred. Although they couldn't say which shape they had seen before, with guesses faring no better than chance, they showed an increased preference for the shapes they had unconsciously perceived previously. In another study, Students were asked to write down three ideas for possible research projects. They were then exposed to the face of either a smiling or scowling professor. The students were not aware that they had been exposed to these faces and reported seeing only a flash of light. They were then asked to rate the quality of the research ideas they had proposed. Those who had been exposed to the scowling face rated their own ideas less favourably than those who had been exposed to the smiling face. In perhaps the most interesting study on unconscious awareness, people have been shown to remember specific events whilst under general anaesthesia. Patients were given headphones which played repetitions of a series of single words. Following surgery, they reported no memory of any particular words. However, if presented with word stems such as GUI or PRO, they were much more likely to complete the words with those which were played to them whilst unconscious. So if the tapes included the words guide or proud, then they were more likely to complete the word stems with these words compared with others. These effects, however, only lasted up to 24 hours, with the best results coming from the test taken immediately following the surgery. These experiments demonstrate a distinction between conscious and unconscious perception, with the latter leading to more automatic reactions. But it's one thing to temporarily affect a person's attitudes or judgments with strictly controlled lab experiments, and a completely different thing to alter their behaviour or habits. One area of subliminal messaging which became extremely popular in the 80s and 90s is subliminal self-help audio tapes. The tapes would consist of music or sounds recorded from nature, but claimed they contained embedded information which was too faint to be consciously heard. Whether you wanted to build your self-confidence, quit smoking or alcohol, improve your memory or cure a phobia, there was a tape for you. There were even audio tapes which claimed to be able to cure deafness. In a study by Greenwald, participants were given tapes which either claimed to improve memory or self-esteem. 
unknown to the participants, half of them were purposely given the wrong tape. After five weeks of use, those who thought they had been listening to the memory tape believed that their memory had improved, regardless of whether they had been listening to the memory tape or actually the self-esteem tape. The same was true for the self-esteem group. The results, however, showed no significant difference in the before and after tests of memory or self-esteem. These results could be more indicative of the fact that the tapes don't actually contain any subliminal messages, rather than simply not being effective. But what about advertising? Real-world studies are hard to come by, given the ethical implications, and those studies which have been done show mixed and inconclusive results. Perhaps most importantly, subliminal messages won't make you do something that you don't want to, or turn you into a mindless zombie. Thanks for watching. Here are a couple of my other videos. Do you have a preference to watch one rather than the other? Huh. Wonder why that is. Subscribe.